Let's continue. Cervantes is also an excellent comedic writer. At this point, he gives us a burlesque version of the stories that we have been witnessing among the Sierra Morena lovers, the captive in Florida, and now Doña Clara and the mule boy. Don Quixote is outside the inn keeping watch, and like the mule boy, he laments his fate as a captive knight of his beloved. Note that Don Quixote's monologue reflects the erotic tone of Doña Clara's story. He imagines Dulcinea pacing about in some gallery of her sumptuous palaces, or perhaps leaning her breasts over a balcony. She is considering how, without risk to her honesty and her nobility, she will tame the storm that my wretched heart suffers on her account. Furthermore, Don Quixote creates a fascinating triangle, imagining himself and his lover gazing up at the same moon, which reminds us of the central role that the moon has for Islam and how it assisted in the flight of the captive and Thoraida. Give me news of her, O luminary of the three faces, perhaps envious of hers, you are now looking down on her. The innkeeper's daughter and Maritornes now set a trap for Don Quixote. The episode contains numerous sexual connotations. The two semi-damsels get Don Quixote to insert his hand through a hole or opening to the hayloft. And then Maritornes throws a strap around it and ties it off at the loft's door. Don Quixote concludes his monologue referring to the classic myth of Daphne's metamorphosis, which occurred when Apollo pursued her across the plains of Thessaly. The innkeeper's wife's daughter now calls to him, and our old but lascivious knight imagines that she is in love with him. Cervantes deploys the free and direct style again to describe how, in an instant, there came into his mad imagination that once again, like the last time, the beauteous damsel, daughter of the lady of that castle, overcome by her love for him, was soliciting his favors. Don Quixote indicates that he cannot satisfy her, although instead of sex, he offers to perform heroic feats for her, even if she were to ask for a lock of the tresses of Medusa, which were all snakes, or perhaps the very rays of sunlight enclosed in a vial. Maritornes manages to get our crazy Hidalgo to come closer to the loft, and she asks him to place his hand through an opening all the while underscoring the danger she is in. If her father were to have heard her, at the very least, he would cut off her ear. There's that ear again, reminding us of the punishment for trying to escape slavery in Algiers, as well as the ear that Don Quixote lost in his battle against the Basque. The description Don Quixote gives of his own hand is both hilarious and erotic. I do not give it to you so that you should kiss it, but so that you might gaze upon the composition of its nerves, the solid texture of its muscles, the width and capacity of its veins, from which you can imagine just how forceful must be the arm that has such a hand. Maritornes promptly ties Don Quixote's hand with nothing less than the halter of Sancho Panza's donkey which she then ties to the loft's door. With Don Quixote now hanging from the side of the barn, the narrator reminds us of Cide Amete's relative in chapter 16, informing us that our hero believes himself to be enchanted, just as when in that same castle he had been thrashed by that magical moor of a mule driver. We are also reminded of Don Quixote's uncertain identification with Amadis. Then he found himself wishing for the sword of Amadis, against which no enchantments had any power. Next, Cervantes relates another complicated exchange. Dawn comes, and Don Quixote was bellowing like a bull when there arrived at the inn four men on horseback, all handsomely dressed and well-equipped, with flintlocks resting on their saddle swells. We will discover in the next chapter that these four men are in search of the mysterious mule boy and that they've come to take him back to Aragon. For now, however, the initial suggestion is the arrival of the law or some royal force echoing the symbolism of the judge as a representative of the state. 
When Don Quixote tells the writers that he is no innkeeper and that this is a castle where there are lodged people who have had a scepter in their hand and a crown on their head, one of the writers expresses ironic disbelief. You must mean the other way around, the scepter on the head and the crown in the hand, for there must be within a congress of actors which often have those crowns and scepters you mention because in such a small inn, I do not think that people worthy of crown and scepter would be lodged. The writer refers to the custom of marking the hands of criminals with the image of a crown and also the poor reputation of anyone associated with the theater. And with this display of contempt for the social status of all the guests of the inn, the writers went back to pounding at the door with great fury. The episode concludes with a repeat of what happened with the young Guesen mares. Rocinante succumbs to sexual temptation. It so happened that one of the beasts on which had arrived the four men who were knocking came over to take a sniff at Rocinante, who, melancholy and sad, with his ears drooping, stood motionless, supporting his stretched out master. And since, after all, he was of flesh and blood, even if at times he seemed to be made of wood, he could not help but make a certain display of feeling and turn to smell the horse who had come to caress him. Note the allusion to the Trojan horse. When Rocinante wanders away, Don Quixote's situation worsens. The final description of the hero hanging from the loft uses the metaphor of the strapado, or reverse hanging, la garrucha in Spanish, a form of torture that was used in cases of serious crimes. He struggled and stretched all he could to reach the ground, just like those who are subjected to the torture of the garrucha, whose feet touch and then almost touch the ground. It's easy to see in all this Cervantes' criticism of the brutal power of the state and the Inquisition. To review, the judge's arrival at the inn and the fortuitous reunion of the Biedma brothers gives way to the case of Doña Clara's love for a mysterious mariner of love who plays the same role as so many other lovers in Don Quixote. Then, like a string of allegories, each referring to the previous, the relationship between Doña Clara and the mule boy gives way to its burlesque version in the trap Maritorne springs on Don Quixote. In fact, the episode is a reminder of the love affairs that are the very essence of the novel. Thus, both the episode's poetry, as well as the description Doña Clara gives of her lover's portrait imprinted on her soul, foreground Neoplatonic love and the associated idea of metamorphosis. And we shouldn't ignore the political turn at the end of the invisible chapter 43. We have Don Quixote disabled and, in fact, tortured, like a puppet against a wall. One of the four recently arrived horsemen implies that all of our guests are criminals. All of this, along with the reference made to certain actors, both theater actors as well as political agents, representantes in Spanish, suggests that other extreme of Plato's cosmic philosophy, namely the political state discussed in the Republic, where collective tyranny is in a perpetual struggle with personal freedom, which some of us perceive and others cannot.